Gospel of Mary Magdalene fully interpreted lovethemeaninggoflife.com. Introduction What remains of the Gospel of Mary was discovered in Upper Egypt near a place called Akhmam. It is a Gnostic text, meaning that it contains esoteric knowledge. It also means that it was outlawed by those who took control of Christian teachings. There would have been a campaign by both the new church authorities and the Orthodox Jewish temple authorities, to seek out and destroy any documents that did not comply with what they were teaching. Those teaching Gnosticism were also hunted down and silenced. It is amazing that any Gnostic texts have survived to this day. The reason that a New Testament was needed was because the hidden meanings of the scriptures were not being taught to the people, who were being given the word without the Spirit. It was being taught by people who could see, but not perceive, could hear, but not understand. There were those in control who did understand, but to reveal what was hidden would have meant the loss of their position and wealth. I have seen what is hidden, and it was never about the physical or material world. It was about the world within and the soul, it was about spiritual things and the real you inside. I will open up the scriptures, removing the veil beneath which lies the most important and precious knowledge that mankind could ever possess. To those who are awakened I say, this will change your life and you will never see this world the same again. My love and peace be unto you. William Gospel of Mary Magdalene, pages 1-6 of the manuscript, containing chapters 1-3, are lost. The extant text starts on page 7. Chapter 4 verse 21. Will matter then be destroyed or not? What remains of verse 21 is a question concerning matter. This of course is not physical matter from which all things are made in this outer world, but rather it is about the spiritual matter which all things in the world within are made from. Simply put the matter that is being referred to as, the substance of the mind. The question being asked therefore is, will the substance of the mind be destroyed or not? It is clear to see that the destruction taking place concerned the end of the world within as it was. The origin of the word matter comes from Latin materia, meaning timber, substance, also subject to discourse, from mater, mother. In spiritual teachings the mind is referred to as the mother and the self's desire is referred to as the father. This is the origin of the spiritual terms male and female, which are likened to the physical male and female. Desire plants the seed of an idea and the mind forms and gives birth to it. Chapter 4 verse 22, the Savior said, All nature, all formations, all creatures exist in and with one another, and they will be resolved again into their own roots. Interpretation, there are two types of world with which the self interacts, and each world is formed from a different type of substance which is referred to as matter. There is the world that you are interacting with at this moment through your physical body and its physical senses, and there is the spiritual world within that you interact with through your spiritual body and spiritual senses. The two worlds and what they contain are likened to each other so that one can be understood by comparing it to the other. The world that is being referred to in these teachings is the spiritual world, which we know as the mind. We each as spiritual beings inhabit our own personal world, mind, unlike the physical world in which we can all interact with together. Each world i.e. physical and spiritual, has its own nature, formations and creatures. The nature of something is the way it behaves. The formations are things formed from the substance. The creatures are formations animated by desire, and therefore are living. There are those that say that things that exist in the mind are not real, but what is real and what is not real? We know what is real because only what is real can cause an effect and be affected, and to do that it must be made of something, it must be made from a substance. If something can cause an effect or be affected it must be real, that includes thoughts. To say that something is not real is to say that it does not exist, and that which does not exist cannot be known. In other words, if the existence of something can be detected by the senses it must be real. It is the way of some that they dismiss what they cannot understand, or what they cannot perceive with their physical senses. Those who are awakened are those who have realized that there is another world, another reality within, one that is unlike the world perceived through the physical senses. The first seven days of Genesis describes what there was in the self-spiritual world, and it is those things that are described as the roots of all that would be generated from them, and all of those things existed in and with one another in the mind. In the beginning everything was perfect. 
there was only the things of righteous desire and truth, but in the pursuit of pleasure and knowledge the nature of everything was changed and the world within became a different place, causing the self to experience a different type of life. Chapter 4 verse 23, for the nature of matter is resolved into the roots of its own nature alone. Interpretation, this simply means that the mind will revert back to its original state, and all that is within it that is not of the self, truth and righteous desire, will be dissolved into its original state of being. This is why it was said, the end is the same as the beginning. Chapter 4 verse 24, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Interpretation, he who has ears to hear, let him hear simply means, listen and understand. Chapter 4 verse 25, Peter said to him, Since you have explained everything to us, tell us this also, what is the sin of the world? Interpretation, Peter has the impression that the world is capable of a sin. Chapter 4 verse 26, the Savior said there is no sin, but it is you who make sin when you do the things that are like the nature of adultery, which is called sin. Interpretation, the statement there is no sin has been taken out of context by some people to mean that no one can do wrong, which in turn means there is no need to feel guilt. It also means that all things are permissible. To sin is to do what is contrary to what is good and right. To be guilty of a sin, the self must first know and understand that what it is doing is in opposition to what is good and right, in other words the self must act intentionally knowing that its actions will cause harm or loss to another. The words, forgive them for they know not what they do means they do not understand what they are doing because they are ignorant of truth and blind to the understanding of it. Adultery here simply means corrupting what is good and right, by choosing to do what is not good and right, in other words, it is being unfaithful. Chapter 4 verse 27, that is why the good came into your midst, to the essence of every nature in order to restore it to its root. Interpretation, that is why love and truth came into your midst to remind you of who and what you were in the beginning of your life journey. The root and essence of every nature is in their beginning and so to return, is to return to righteousness and innocence. This is why it was said that you must come to know yourself and that you must become as a little child, in other words, born again. Chapter 4 verse 28, then he continued and said, that is why you become sick and die, for you are deprived of the one who can heal you. Interpretation, to become sick and die is to become spiritually corrupted, and forget who and what you are. The one who can heal you is the spirit of understanding. Chapter 4 verse 29, he who has a mind to understand, let him understand. Interpretation, he who is able to see the truth let him understand. There is the feeling of truth, and there is the seeing what it means in the light of understanding. Chapter 4 verse 30, matter gave birth to a passion that has no equal, which proceeded from something contrary to nature. Then there arises a disturbance in its whole body. Interpretation, the substance of mind gave birth to a very strong desire that has no equal, it was the desire for pleasure. It originated from something contrary to nature, which had existed in a state of peace and without need. The disturbance that arose was due to the as yet unfulfilled desire. Peace was lost and suffering had begun. It would continue that way until all desire had been fulfilled, or until desire itself was overcome. Pleasure had first been felt when the self had realized its own existence, and had created an image of itself in the mind. It was the first of all pleasures to be experienced, and the first truth to be known. It was also the beginning of a life journey, one that would be driven by desire, the father of all that would be created in the mother mind, which is the self's domain that it is the ruler of. It can be seen that in the physical world, outside of the self's domain, that the state of the nature of things is a state of peace and lack of need. Only sentient beings have the attribute of desire. Chapter 4 verse 31, that is why I said to you, be of good courage, and if you are discouraged be encouraged in the presence of the different forms of nature. Interpretation, it takes a lot of courage to choose peace over the desire for personal pleasure, but it is good courage. Peace can only be experienced in the absence of need. It is a state of contentment and rest. The desire for personal pleasure on the other hand is never content, it constantly needs renewing with a fresher experience of pleasure. When the self is discouraged at choosing peace over the desire for personal pleasure, it should be encouraged in the presence of the different forms of nature that need nothing and are therefore in a state of peace, everything that they need is already provided. 
the desire for personal pleasure is the cause of all the sin and suffering in the world, because everyone is competing with each other for the fulfillment of their own desire for pleasure, and they can never get enough. Chapter 4 verse 32, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Interpretation, He who is able to feel the truth, let him feel it. Chapter 4 verse 33, When the Blessed One had said this, he greeted them all, saying, Peace be with you. Receive my peace unto yourselves. Interpretation, to be blessed is to be filled with the things that are of love and truth. Peace is experienced when there is no conflict. It is achieved through unconditional love, which leaves no desire to be fulfilled, thereby ending the disturbance created by unfulfilled desire. Peace is therefore a state of silence. To receive someone's peace is to receive their unconditional love. Is this not what all loving souls search for? Chapter 4 verse 34, Beware that no one lead you astray saying, Lo here or lo there. For the Son of Man is within you. Interpretation, the conversation taking place is between people in this physical world. They are people just like you, and the Son of Man is within you also, whether your physical body is male or female. This is because the self within is a spiritual entity and not a physical one. It is the self within that animates the physical body, and it is not of the physical world. All spiritual beings are referred to as being male, it is only the mind that is referred to as being female. The self's desire is referred to as the father, and the mind is referred to as the mother. Notice the capitals that begin the words. When they are used they are referring to that which existed in the beginning. The son of man is the son of the true self, in other words it is the true image of the self. That image of your true self is within you, it is referred to as your soul, your alter ego, your other I, the father becomes the son, the son becomes the father. The son is the self's alter ego through which the self interacts with the world within, and it is through the physical body that interaction with the physical world takes place. Verse 434 is simply saying, do not let anyone deceive you, the son of man is not in or of the physical world, but rather the son of man is within you. Chapter 4 verse 35, follow after him. Interpretation, follow after your true self, the one inside that is of love and truth, the one you began your life journey as. This is also saying that it is not another soul that you should follow, but rather it is your own righteous soul. Chapter 4 verse 36, those who seek him will find him. Interpretation, those who search for their true self will find him. This is why it is said, when you come to know yourselves, then you will become known. Gospel of Thomas, Logian 3. Chapter 4 verse 37, Go then and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Interpretation, the gospel of the kingdom is the truth about the self and its true domain. The righteous self and mind, heaven. Chapter 4 verse 38, Do not lay down any rules beyond what I appointed you, and do not give a law like the lawgiver lest you be constrained by it. Interpretation, rules are laid down for the purpose of uniting people in a common cause, which people may abide by or not according to their preferences. The Savior only laid down rules to follow which were good and right, but there was always a choice to accept or reject them, in other words, people were not forced to follow them. The lawgiver on the other hand makes laws for the sole purpose of controlling others and having power over them, and breaking those laws carries a penalty of harm or loss. In other words, people are forced to obey them even if they are unjust. Laws are made to take power away from people, and they are always enforced with violence, either physical or psychological. This is why it was said, let him who possesses power renounce it. Gospel of Thomas, Logian 81 It is laws that are unjust that tempt people to lie and to do what they hate. The only laws that stand eternally, are the laws of love, truth and understanding. Chapter 4 verse 39, When he said this he departed. Interpretation, the students were then left to discuss things amongst themselves. Chapter 5 verse 1, But they were grieved. They wept greatly, saying, How shall we go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel of the kingdom of the Son of Man? If they did not spare him, how will they spare us? Interpretation, what you have to consider here is that the teachings that the students were charged with taking to the people was a New Testament. It was different to the one being taught by the temple authorities, who had hidden the key to the understanding of the scriptures. The people believed they were being led to salvation but they were not, instead they were being led away from it and into captivity. 
the students were very worried about the prospect of challenging the teachings of the very powerful temple authorities and were worried that the people would not believe them because of the indoctrination they had received. The students had seen how the temple authorities had reacted to the Savior, accusing him of blasphemy and of being evil. How they wondered would they themselves be able to cope as the Savior did? How would they be treated? Gentiles are people who have no awareness or understanding of the true nature of their being as a spiritual entity. They believe that they are physical beings, made from and existing in the world that they perceive through their physical senses. There are those who believe in a God, and those who do not. Those Gentiles who believe in a God believe that their God is a physical being that exists in a physical realm in the sky. There are Gentiles who believe in a single God, and there are others who believe in many gods. There are also Gentiles that do not believe in the existence of any God. Where a Gentile believes in a God or gods, they believe that their God or gods are physical beings that exist in a physical domain of their own, for example, heaven, Olympus etc. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. There are also those who believe that they are Jews but are not. Those who believe that they are Jews but are not, are in reality Gentiles. True Jews are those who are aware of and understand that they are spiritual beings and not physical beings. The temple authorities had been teaching scriptures literally, interpreting them without the spirit, which was the key of understanding. In other words, they had been teaching physical doctrines. Because of this they were referred to as, blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Matthew chapter 15 verse 14 KJV, this is why a New Testament was needed, one of love, truth and understanding, one in which the law was not changed, but the understanding of it was. The Savior had accused the temple authorities of being the children of the devil which is the unrighteous heart. The people were not being set free, they were being enslaved and used to empower and enrich the temple authorities, but the Savior saw what they were doing, they were teaching the word without the spirit, they were teaching physical doctrines, not spiritual ones. The Savior had said to the temple authorities, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Matthew chapter 23 verse 15 KJV Also I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Revelation chapter 2 verse 9 KJV Is it any wonder that the Savior's students were afraid of going out and teaching people of what they really were, and of the kingdom in which they belonged? Being a Jew is not a genetic thing, it is a spiritual thing. The truth would set the people free, but it would also take away the temple authorities' power and wealth, and they would do anything to prevent that happening. They did, they have, and are still doing so. Chapter 5 verse 2, Then Mary stood up, greeted them all, and said to her brethren, Do not weep and do not grieve nor be irresolute, for his grace will be entirely with you and will protect you. Interpretation, it was Mary who stood up and comforted them. She was the strongest and most faithful of them all, and she was the one with the greatest understanding, a light in their time of darkness. Her strength was amazing considering how women were regarded as less than men in those days, and also wrongly blamed for Mont's downfall. She was, out of all the Savior's students, the most blessed. To have the Savior's grace entirely with them is to feel and act as he did, and that is what would protect them. Chapter 5 verse 3, But rather, let us praise his greatness, for he has prepared us and made us into men. Interpretation, when Mary said, he has prepared us and made us into men, she was without doubt saying that she also had been prepared and made into a man. To be prepared and made into a man, is to learn and realize the true nature of the self and soul, which spiritually is male. The self is not the physical body, it is that which animates the physical body, and there is no difference in gender between one sentient spiritual being and another. The only difference between any of us is found in and of the mind. Inside we are all the same. The self is male and the mind is female. The only difference between one spiritual being and another is the perception of what they believe themselves to be, and this difference occurs not in the self but in the mind. In other words, the self does not and cannot change its form, but it can change what it believes itself to be in the mind. It is when the self forgets what it is that it comes to believe that it is the physical body, and that it has a gender determined by that physical body. 
the perception of gender difference between spiritual beings as an illusion, and once that illusion is shattered the self comes to know itself. There is no wrong in one spiritual being loving another, regardless of what gender the physical body is that they animate. Chapter 5 verse 4, when Mary said this, she turned their hearts to the good, and they began to discuss the words of the Savior. Interpretation, Mary had changed their hearts that had been filled with fear and the desire for self-preservation and caring only for themselves, to the desire to do what was good and right for others, this is the way of love. Instead of thinking about themselves they now started discussing the words of the Savior. Chapter 5 verse 5, Peter said to Mary, Sister we know that the Savior loved you more than the rest of women. Interpretation, there were other women students being taught by the Savior, but Peter and the other male students knew that Mary was the closest to the Savior, and therefore would have been taught things in private. Notice that Peter was still defining other souls by their physical gender. Chapter 5 verse 6, tell us the words of the Savior which you remember which you know, but we do not, nor have we heard them. Interpretation, Peter and the other students wanted to know from Mary what those teachings were that they hadn't heard. Notice that here Peter is acknowledging that Mary was taught things in private by the Savior. Chapter 5 verse 7, Mary answered and said, What is hidden from you I will proclaim to you. Interpretation, there were teachings hidden from the other students that were only given to Mary. This was because the other students had not yet achieved the same level of understanding that Mary had. Chapter 5 verse 8, And she began to speak to them these words, I, she said, I saw the Lord in a vision and I said to him, Lord I saw you today in a vision. He answered and said to me, Interpretation, Mary begins to tell the others about a conversation that she had with the Savior in private. The conversation concerned a v-zone in which she had seen him. It was not the Savior in physical form that she had seen, but rather it was the soul that inhabited and animated that body. She had seen the real Savior inside. In using the word, I, she was referring directly to herself as a spiritual being. Mary had told the Savior, Lord I saw you today in a vision, meaning she had seen the real Him, His spiritual self. The Savior then answered her, saying, Chapter 5 verse 9, Blessed are you that you did not waver at the sight of me. For where the mind is there is the treasure. Interpretation, Mary was blessed because she was able to see the Savior as a spiritual being and she had no doubt about the reality of what she saw. The Savior said, for where the mind is there is the treasure, meaning there is the true image of the nature of a spiritual being. Mary had seen the image of the Savior and she did not waver, was not afraid because she understood. Chapter 5 verse 10, I said to him, Lord, how does he who sees the vision see it, through the soul or through the spirit? Interpretation, Mary had seen a vision and she wanted to know how she saw it. She knew that there was a difference between what is normally seen and a v-zone. She wanted to know if she had seen the vision through the soul, which is the self's image of itself in the mind or through the spirit, which is the soul's spirit of understanding. Chapter 5 verse 11, the Savior answered and said, He does not see through the soul nor through the spirit, but the mind that is between the two that is what sees the vision and it is. Interpretation, a dream is not a vision, a dream is seen through the soul and what the spirit of understanding sees are images from the subconscious mind. A vision on the other hand is seen directly by the self through a part of the mind that is not influenced by the subconscious or any preconceived ideas, or desires. A dream is open to temptation, whereas a v-zone is not, it is seen in the pure light of understanding. Pages 11 to 14 are missing from the manuscript, chapter 8 introduction, the first nine verses are also missing from this chapter, but what is missing is not lost because the information can be found in other scriptures. Chapter 5 reveals knowledge given to Mary by the Savior in private and that knowledge continues here with the revelation of how the Savior overcame the influence of the four unrighteous powers, and the seven spirits of wrath. Every soul possesses these four powers and seven spirits. In the beginning they were all righteous, but due to interaction with the world they became corrupted, thereby corrupting the soul, and taking control over it. It was Paul who said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 KJV. The four powers are, darkness, desire, ignorance and death. The seven spirits of wrath are the seven fallen angels. 
The four powers are mentioned for example in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, where they are described as four horses, or four beasts. The seven angels are also mentioned and are referred to as the angels, stars of the seven churches. When the powers are righteous they are referred to as light, contentment, knowledge and life. The first power to be overcome and how that was achieved, is the part missing from the beginning of chapter 8, and it concerns the power of darkness, the power that must be overcome by the power of light. The power of light is the power of understanding the difference between right and wrong. This can only be achieved through questioning, contemplation, and consideration. It is when this is not done that the darkness conceals the light and truth remains a mystery. Chapter 8 verse 9, it chapter 8 begins with what is left of verse 9 which is a single word, it. What remains of the section relating to the overcoming of desire, which is the second power, begins with verse 10. Desire is a strong feeling of need. It occurs within and is of the self. It is the self's power to change something according to the self's will. It is the power to cause, to affect and to create. It is the power to gain something that the self has recognized but does not possess. There are only three states that the self is able to experience and they are, a state of peace, a state of pleasure, and a state of suffering. A state of peace is experienced only in the absence of active desire. A state of suffering is experienced when a desire is not yet fulfilled and desire is still active. A state of pleasure is experienced only when a desire is fulfilled. In the absence of desire the self would do nothing, not even move a finger, there would be no worry, no anxiety and no caring. The self would be in a state of repose, rest, silence. The meaning of life beyond experiencing a state of peace in which there is no meaning other than to simply exist, is to pursue and experience pleasure. But a problem occurs when the soul gains the knowledge of both good and evil, and doesn't possess the light of understanding. It is because of this that desire is unleashed to pursue pleasure any way it wants. Now back to interpreting what is left of verse 10. Chapter 8 verse 10, And desire said, I did not see you descending, but now I see you ascending. Why do you lie since you belong to me? Interpretation, desire had become the master of the soul, and while the soul was doing as desire requested, it did not notice the soul. But now the soul is disobeying desire and is noticed. Previously the soul had been descending into servitude, but now the soul was ascending to be its own master. Either you become the master of desire, or it becomes the master of you. When the heart is divided there are two opposing desires. That is why it was said, no man can serve two masters. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 KJV. It is the self's desire that creates the soul, and that is why it said to the soul, you belong to me. But the soul was created by righteous desire, and not by the unrighteous desire that had taken control of the soul. The soul was not lying, because it knew its true father. Chapter 8 verse 11, The soul answered and said, I saw you. You did not see me nor recognize me. I served you as a garment and you did not know me. Interpretation, previously the soul had not been in possession of the light of understanding. This meant that desire was also in the darkness making it blind, and so it did not see the soul, nor did desire recognize that it belonged to the soul. The soul had served desire as a garment, meaning that desire was within the soul, just as the physical heart is within the physical body. The soul was able to see desire, because it was now in possession of the light of understanding, however, desire which had become corrupted was unable to comprehend that light. Put simply, either the head rules the heart, or the heart rules the head. Chapter 8 verse 12, when it said this, it the soul, went away rejoicing greatly. Interpretation, the soul had conquered its unrighteous desire and was its servant no more, it was now free and very joyful to be so. Chapter 8 verse 13, again it came to the third power, which is called ignorance. Interpretation, it is said that ignorance is a lack of knowledge or awareness, but to understand clearly what ignorance is, its causes must first be considered. Ignorance cannot simply be a matter of not possessing knowledge, because a person may be given knowledge and still be ignorant due to lack of knowledge or the rejection of it. Ignorance is first caused by a lack of understanding, and then by the desire to reject the validity of that knowledge in favor of opposing knowledge. In other words, a person without understanding will believe what they want to believe, regardless of what they know. 
ignorance may be unintentional due to a lack of knowledge, or understanding of that knowledge. Ignorance becomes intentional when a person possesses knowledge and understanding, but chooses to ignore it in order to achieve what it desires. Regardless of whether a person is ignorant or not, it must be realized that the third power is the power on which we base our judgments, and so it is the third power that determines whether our judgments are righteous or unrighteous. We should not judge others until we have submitted ourselves to the judgment of truth, understanding and love. It is said that ignorance is bliss, but that is only until reality comes knocking on the door. That reality is the sudden realization of the understanding of truth, and it comes like a flood, washing away all that was desired to be true but was not. Chapter 8 verse 14, the power questioned the soul, saying, Where are you going? In wickedness are you bound? But you are bound, do not judge. Interpretation, the soul had left the servitude of desire, and in doing so was also leaving the power of ignorance. Ignorance didn't understand what was happening, and so it asked the soul where are you going, it still thought that the soul was in the servitude of desire, and so was bound by wickedness, and so had no right to judge the power of ignorance, and it told the soul so. Chapter 8 verse 15, and the soul said, why do you judge me, although I have not judged? Interpretation, the soul was being judged by its own power of ignorance, but the soul no longer had faith in its understanding, and it no longer wanted to be ruled by desire. It had become like the wise man that realizes he knows nothing. In other words, for all the knowledge that the soul possessed it realized that it knew nothing that would bring it peace and end its suffering. It is because of this that the soul no longer judged. Chapter 8 verse 16, I was bound, though I have not bound. Interpretation, the soul had not taken control of its powers, and so the powers had taken control of the soul, and because of this the soul had been bound in their wickedness. Chapter 8 verse 17, I was not recognized. But I have recognized that the all is being dissolved, both the earthly things and the heavenly. Interpretation, the soul had not been recognized by the power of desire, but the soul had recognized that the all was being dissolved, both the earthly things and the heavenly. The all is the mind and all that is contained therein. Everything that exists in the mind, including the soul, exists only by the will of the self. They exist because the self desires their existence. When these things are no longer needed they dissolve back into their roots. In other words, nothing will be left other than what existed in the beginning. If the soul has conquered the things that are unrighteous and has made all things new, the soul then represents the true and first image of the self, and it returns once more to be one with the its father, the self's desire. Only the things that are righteous may return to their beginning. This is why it was said, I and the Father are one. John chapter 10 verse 30 KJV. Chapter 8 verse 18, when the soul had overcome the third power, it went upwards and saw the fourth power, which took seven forms. Interpretation, the soul had overcome its first three powers, but what had happened, what had caused the change, what had the soul realized that gave it the strength to overcome them? In scriptures the powers are likened to beasts, because they can be wild and have a strong will of their own, which makes them unruly and dominating until they are tamed. In the book of Revelation they are likened to horses. Now a horse that is broken, i.e. tamed, will take you where you want to go, but a horse that is unbroken, i.e. untamed will only take you where it wants to go. It can be seen that concerning the soul's first three powers, the soul had simply disowned its powers, it had walked away from its unruly, untamed, beasts, horses, it had given up its powers, it had realized that it alone was the master of itself. If you want peace then you must first come to know yourself, that you alone have dominion of your life, and that you must silence your heart, having no desires, and you should refrain from judging because there are things that you neither know nor understand. The soul had overcome its first three personal powers, which were inner powers, but there was one more personal inner power left to overcome, and this was the power of death, which began as the power of life. This fourth power is given according to the influence of the seven spirits, and with death they are referred to as the seven powers of wrath. It is the soul's choice as to whether it will take those powers, or leave them. What the soul chooses is either peace, or wrath which is hate. Chapter 8 verse 19, the first form is darkness, the second desire, the third ignorance, the fourth is the excitement of death, the fifth is the kingdom of the flesh, the sixth is the foolish wisdom of flesh, the seventh is the wrathful wisdom. These are the seven powers of wrath. 
Interpretation, these seven spirits were originally good spirits, they were righteous, they were formed in the first seven days of the self's life journey, one for each of the self's first days of creation. These seven days are recorded in the book of Genesis. The seven powers are the powers of the seven spirits, and so they are the self's spiritual powers, also referred to as angels. In verse 19 those powers are the powers of the spirits that have fallen from grace, in other words, they are the powers of fallen angels. The power of the spirits is the power to influence, and depending on the nature of the spirits, that influence may be to either do what is good and right, or what is bad and wrong. Their presence and effects are felt by everyone throughout their life journey. Where there is influence there is also the choice to reject or conform, and what is chosen depends on wisdom or the lack of it. It is the spirits that we choose to conform to that determine the path that we take on our life journey. There are only three paths for the soul to choose from, and it is our spirits that guide us. There is the narrow path, the wide path and the ditch. On the narrow path we are guided only by righteous spirits. On the path that is a ditch we are guided only by unrighteous spirits. On the wide path we are guided by both. Both fully righteous and fully unrighteous spirits are perfect in their nature, they are perfect opposites, a duality. But between every duality there is a space that forms a triality, a space where there is only conflict and imperfection as the two opposites struggle against each other. This is the wide path where the soul bends like a reed in the wind, alternating between the influence of righteous and unrighteous spirits. It is the reason for all suffering, suffering that will only end when the soul becomes faithful to one and rejects the other completely. With the light of righteous spirits the soul receives eternal life, but with unrighteous spirits the soul ceases to exist when its life journey is over and the self has to create a new soul for the next life journey. This is why it was said that the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 KJV The powers of the unrighteous spirits in verse 19 and their righteous opposites are as follows. Powers of peace powers of wrath light darkness righteous desire unrighteous desire knowledge ignorance excitement of life excitement of death kingdom of the spirit kingdom of the flesh prudent wisdom of the flesh foolish wisdom of the flesh peaceful wisdom wrathful wisdom the first power of wrath is the power of darkness which is the complete absence of light. The light is the light of understanding. It is in the light that the true meaning of what is known becomes exposed. The light is the spirit of the word, when the truth stands under the light truth is revealed. The self's first knowledge was knowledge of its own existence, but there was no understanding of what that meant until the self created an image of itself in its mind, and all images are formed from light. Awareness is feeling, consciousness is seeing. To feel is to know, to see is to understand what is known. When the self loses the ability to understand, it is because it either does not want to put in the effort, or it does not want to see the truth. The mind then remains in darkness, which is the absence of understanding. The best that the self has then, is no understanding or misunderstanding. The second power which is desire, is dependent on the nature of the first power. If the first power is light, then desire becomes righteous. If the first power is darkness then desire becomes unrighteous. It is then that all things become permissible in the pursuit of fulfilling desire. When the first power falls the soul is left without a conscience. When the second power falls the soul is left without empathy. The third righteous power is the power of discernment, which is the power to recognize or find out knowledge that is good or knowledge that is not. It is the ability to gather knowledge and distinguish the difference between knowledge of good and knowledge of evil. When the third power falls it results in the loss of righteous judgment. This is because of the absence or denial of knowledge that is good, the absence of correct understanding, and because of the unrighteous heart. The fourth power is the power of inspiration, which causes the soul to feel excited and filled with enthusiasm due to its beliefs. The fourth power began as the excitement of life. Its nature was determined by the soul's first three righteous powers. Life is only found in the things that are eternal, the things given by righteous powers. When the fourth power fell it became the excitement of death, which meant that the soul was inspired by things that were temporary, things that would be dissolved at the end of the soul's journey. The soul can only keep and take with it the things that are of love and truth. The fifth power began as the kingdom of the spirit, which is the righteous mind also referred to as the kingdom of the son of man. 
when the fifth power fell it became the kingdom of the flesh, which is a reference to the carnal mind, the mind ruled by the Antichrist. The flesh is a reference to the body, or more accurately, the meat of the body. In scripture the spiritual body is likened to the physical body. The difference is that the spiritual body, i.e. the soul, exists in and is formed from the substance of mind. Put simply the soul's body is formed from knowledge. When the soul is righteous its flesh is truth. In John chapter 1 verse 14 KJV it is written, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It is also written in Matthew chapter 26 verse 26 KJV, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and blessed it, and brake it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Things become clear when you realize that it was the soul of Jesus that was speaking, and that the bread represents the truth. It is when the soul forgets its true nature, and comes to believe that it is a physical being with a physical body, that the mind becomes carnal. In other words, the soul believes its domain as a physical one. The fall occurs because the soul does not know itself anymore. That is why it is said that you must come to know yourselves. When a life journey ends, the physical body is discarded by the soul, and is never animated again. The sixth power is the power of prudent wisdom. The definition of prudent is acting with or showing care and thought for the future. When the sixth power fell it became the foolish wisdom of the flesh. This is when the soul begins to live and care only for the moment, the now. It is because of this that nothing good is learned from the past, and the consequences of the soul's actions are not taken into account. To still the mind is to absolve the soul of any and all responsibility. Stilling the mind is not meditation, it is an attempt to focus on nothing, an attempt to empty the mind for the purpose of calming all emotions, so that a state of peace can be experienced. Stilling the mind only results in a complete state of ignorance. Meditation on the other hand is a state of deep thought, a state of contemplation that requires the full focus of attention on a specific subject. It is a search for truth and understanding. The seventh power is the power of loving wisdom, and that love is unconditional. Loving wisdom is the wisdom of the contented heart, in which there are no desires left to fulfill. The seventh power is the power of love, truth and understanding. It is when the first six righteous powers fall from grace that the seventh power becomes wrathful wisdom. Wrath is extreme anger, a feeling of hate in which there is no peace. It is said that wisdom stands or falls on its own merits, which are the worth of its deeds, for the wages rewards of sin is death for the soul. The wages rewards of righteousness is eternal life for the soul. There is the wisdom of love and there is the wisdom of hate. The seven righteous powers are the seven pillars of heaven, the righteous mind. The seven unrighteous powers are the pillars of hell, the unrighteous mind. In the end only the righteous pillars will be left standing. Nothing is finished until the end and until then, the soul has the choice of what its finished temple will be. If you feel worried and anxious it should be realized that what you are feeling is the effect of the powers of wrath. It is because you have not become their master. Chapter 8 verse 20, they asked the soul, Whence do you come slayer of men, or where are you going, conqueror of space? Interpretation, the seven powers, spirits of wrath, asked the soul where it had come from, they didn't know that the soul had come from the light, because those of the darkness could not comprehend the light. They called the soul slayer of men, meaning slayer of personified spirits. It was because the soul was ascending to a place that they were unaware of, that they asked the soul where are you going? The space that the soul had been conquering was of course the mind. The soul was becoming its own master. Chapter 8 verse 21, the soul answered and said, What binds me has been slain, and what turns me about has been overcome. Interpretation, it can be seen in verse 14 that the soul was accused of being bound in wickedness. That wickedness was the darkness of the unrighteous mind, in which there was no light of understanding. The soul had slain the darkness of the unrighteous mind with the light of understanding. That which had turned the soul about was the temptation of unrighteous desire, which had now been overcome. Chapter 8 verse 22, And my desire has been ended, and ignorance has died. Interpretation, the soul had realized that between desire and the fulfillment of desire there is only suffering, and the end had never justified the means. The only way to gain lasting peace was to give up desire, to want nothing. 
The heart had become corrupted and the only way to gain peace once more was to empty and silence it. Ignorance had died because the soul no longer felt the urge to judge. It had realized that there was so much that it didn't know or understand. Chapter 8 verse 23, In a eon I was released from a world, and in a type from a type, and from the fetter of oblivion which is transient. Interpretation, here in verse 23, eon is a reference to the age of ascendance in which the soul was released from a world of servitude, and in a higher state from a lower state, a type from a type, and from the restraint of forgetfulness, oblivion, which is temporary, transient. Chapter 8 verse 24, From this time on will I attain to the rest of the time, of the season, of the eon, in silence. Interpretation, the soul had remembrance of its true nature, notice the use of the word, I, and for the rest of its life journey it would succeed in accomplishing a state of peace. What you have just read is the secret of how the Savior overcame its unrighteous spirits, and conquered the world within. Everyone has a soul, and when it is made righteous and becomes its own master, it becomes a savior. Chapter 9 verse 1, When Mary had said this, she fell silent, since it was to this point that the Savior had spoken with her. Interpretation, Mary had listened to the Savior's words and her soul had understood them, and in understanding them she fell silent, she had received the Savior's peace, the perfect peace that comes from knowing and understanding the truth. Chapter 9 verse 2, But Andrew answered and said to the brethren, Say what you wish to say about what she has said. I at least do not believe that the Savior said this. For certainly these teachings are strange ideas. Interpretation, Andrew did not possess the same depth of understanding as Mary, there were things that he could see but not perceive, and things that he could hear but not understand. The Savior had not yet revealed the deeper mysteries to him, because he was not yet ready to receive them. This is why Andrew did not believe what Mary said, and why he thought the teachings were strange ideas. Chapter 9 verse 3, Peter answered and spoke concerning these same things. Interpretation, Peter felt the same as Andrew, as many people today do when they read the scriptures. Chapter 9 verse 4, he questioned them about the Savior, did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? Interpretation, Peter felt offended at the thought of a woman being told things that he and the others were not told. He still had the belief that men were more worthy than women, and that what men say is more important than what women say. It was a huge blow to Peter's pride. Chapter 9 verse 5, Then Mary wept and said to Peter, My brother Peter, what do you think? Do you think that I have thought this up myself in my heart, or that I am lying about the Savior? Interpretation, Mary was offended because Peter was basically accusing her of lying and making things up. Chapter 9 verse 6, Levi answered and said to Peter, Peter you have always been hot-tempered. Interpretation, Levi reminded Peter that he had always been hot-tempered, meaning he had always been quick to judge, a thing they were told not to do. Chapter 9 verse 7, Now I see you contending against the woman like the adversaries. Interpretation, Peter was seen by Levi as treating Mary like an opponent, someone who was against them, an outsider. Chapter 9 verse 8, But if the Savior made her worthy, who are you indeed to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. Interpretation, Levi stood up for Mary, reminding Peter that the Savior had made her worthy. The Savior had done this by making her a man. Indeed it is written in chapter 5 to 3 that the Savior made them all into men. To be made into a man is to be reminded of the true nature of the soul, which is spiritually male, the mind is referred to spiritually as being female. It is because the Savior knew her soul, the real Mary inside, that he knew her very well. Souls do not have a physical gender. Chapter 9 verse 9, that is why he loved her more than us. Rather let us be ashamed and put on the perfect man, and separate as he commanded us and preach the gospel, not laying down any other rule or other law beyond what the Savior said. Interpretation, the shame was in seeing Mary as a physical being rather than seeing and perceiving the real Mary inside as a soul. To put on the perfect man, is to recognize themselves as uncorrupted souls, to remember the true nature of their being. The students also known as disciples would thus separate and each go their own way, teaching others the gospel of the kingdom of the Son of Man, teaching only what they had been taught by the Savior. Chapter 9 verse 10, And when they heard this they began to go forth to proclaim and to preach. 
interpretation, they had heard the truth and understood it, they were no longer afraid. They were also humble and filled with faith. It was Mary who turned their hearts to the good. She was at that point, the most blessed and awakened of them all, and a soulmate to the Savior. A message from William, to those who have the ears to hear and the eyes to perceive, you are indeed blessed, and it is my hope that you have enjoyed the food that I have laid before you. You will live forever, protect that little child within you that is your soul, and love, truth, understanding, and peace, will be yours eternally.